Howdy folks. Got the tea. Hopefully, this will be nice if this comes up first time without dropping frames, that would be lovely. Just for a change. Um, hope my audio level's good. Let me know if it isn't. Hmm. Um, I finished the decorating in the uh, family room, <laughs> but uh, one of the things I had to do is take everything off the wall, etc. Because we were, I was, I was repainting them and stuff. I now have one of these, which is the internal connector my um, RF aerial I somehow managed to jar the uh, connector when the cable still in it and it snapped it clean out and it's recessed as well I can't get to it I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to fix that that's a real pain it was just like one of those oh no moments I'm afraid which is a bit of a pain so I mean the TV still works, I mean it's connected to an Xbox and Playstation and other things and stuff as well. Um, so all the, um, you know, Netflix and all of that stuff still still work. It's just the, uh, the Freeview, which is a UK over air broadcast, digital broadcast, DAB2 broadcast. That won't work because I can't connect the aerial in any any longer. Just a bit frustrating because it's kind of useful sometimes. But there you go. These things happen. Um, so it's Friday night here. I say Friday night, Friday evening. So it's still very light outside because we're in, in early summer. I hope you're ones good better let everyone know that we are running da -da -da. I had a few errands to run. I'm doing some code this afternoon. Went round in circles for a little bit. Um, had an issue with some code, thinking it was a hardware thing, and it definitely wasn't. I took the new black, the um, current uh, prototype of the Black Ice NXT apart because I wanted to check the orientation of the components, make sure there weren't any shorts. Turns out there wasn't an issue, it was just a software thing. But I managed to waste a bit of time doing that. Did I, do today? I don't seem to have done a huge amount, quite frankly. I seem to have spent quite a lot of time doing it. But as I say, I did every every other piece of work I did, I had to stop and then run a chore, or taxi someone somewhere, or go and pick something up for someone else, or etc. etc. So it was just a bit, a bit of a bitty day, really. I mean, given what time I started this morning, which was pretty early. So I woke up and couldn't get back to sleep. There you go. Oh, mind you, I know. That's because I had to do my VAT first thing. I spent quite a bit of time going through all the transactions. Like you do. Uh, hi, Opost. How you doing? Oh, 
Oh, hi, Laurie. It's a bit of buzz on the audio again. Um, let me just fiddle with the cable. Tell me if it stops. I'm intrigued whether this is... Does that make any difference? I'm wondering if it's the connector on this mic. Uh, iPost doesn't hear any buzz. buzz. Yeah, it's gone. It is. It's something to do with that cable. It's... Um, I'm not sure if it's the actual um, XLL cable connector or ca cable itself, or it's the um, contacts on the microphone, which is an XLR, needs an XLR cable because it's differential. It's also phantom powered, 48 volt powered. <clears throat> but uh, it was in storage for a while and I think it got a bit damp. Um, so there's a bit of oxi oxidisation, certainly on the cabling and stuff. I need to go through it. I might order some new cables actually. That might um, might sort it out. I need to have a look. Good. We're not dropping any frames either, which is nice. And I have tea. Um. So what was I working on today? Let's just, let's just, one of the things I was working on this afternoon, um, let me just do that in a sec. Um, but one of the things I suddenly thought, oh, I haven't um, done anything on is the, um, the flash stuff. So I figured I'd better check that um, that is actually operational. Which sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, so let's just bring that up. Um, what do we want to cover today? Anything in particular? Let me know. Um, oh, I solved the problem we had on Wednesday, Wednesday stream. I remember what the problem was. Yes, I wasn't getting a response on the QSPI uh, transactions. The um, the sending from the SCM32 to the um, to the I40 to the synthesized stuff. That turned out to be really simple. Um, let me just switch actually to uh, viewer. To the um, main firmware. So um, what that was was this. I forgot to bit bang the um, SS pins, so I was doing the right without using the SS pins because um, I, I did a bit of copy and paste from the original QSPI version, and of course on that previous version we weren't using, um, you know, bit bang controlled uh, CS or SS. Um, it was automatic. Um, and as soon as I added these back in, then um, Bob your uncle, it worked. Surprisingly, that was the solution. Um, iPost is asking about HDMI. Um, we could have a discussion about what repositories you're going to have. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, to do the HDMI, it's going to be a bit more complicated. I'd, I'd need to build the, um, I'd need to reflow the uh, HDMI tile and then locate some HDMI. Um, 
HDL um, on that subject are you or either of you aware of a uh, Amaranth slash Enmigen HDMI um, implementation I haven't seen one And we should definitely discuss repositories because it's all a bit mixed up. Ah, uh, Laurie says, I have an Amaranth HDMI implementation from GuzTech. Not heard of GuzTech. Do you have a link, Laurie? I better check. Have I got the stuff? Can I put that together today? Um, I would need. What would I need? I would need I'm just going through the board for me. Should have the boards in here. Let's see if it's in there. Um, does this Amaranth version of HDMI use anything specific to URLX3? I'm sure they are here. Hold on, maybe I've got my um, packets mixed up. What are they? Oh, there we go. Oh, I seem to have put one here. So I have a board for HDMI that we could do. I'd have to reflow it. Um, and I haven't prepped my solder paste or anything. Um,
the uh, stencil. All right. I don't think it's ULX free specific. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, VGA, VGA timings. Where do I need to look? VGA test. TM, DS encoder. Let's have a look at VGA test. I should probably share this with you folks as well. Um, Just looking through this to see if, um, if they're doing anything. Um, might be a little ambitious without some prep uh, vendor specific DDR modules I don't know if these they're using the DDR output the DDR IO output features I don't know whether these are different
are these buttons from? Um, I just wonder if this is going to work the same. Is this the same code? That's the bit I'm slightly unsure about. I mean, I don't know about the LEDs and the other stuff. I think that's probably less important. I'm not quite sure what they're using those for. Um, H1 platform request in range. That's my idea from my Yeah, I'm less worried about the buttons and stuff because we can deal with that. Um, I was more worried about the um, DDR outputs and whether that would need to be changed. I don't suppose you've tried it on a black ice. Sorry. I might want a bit more prep to get this working, I think. Not only do I have to make the hardware for it to work. Um, I probably want to check out the um, the IO specific um, instances.
don't know if, if I want to dive this deep on a Friday. Um, so how many does this, how many, what does this use? Import your extra boards. Think VGA TV ID. Import VGA timings. Be five PNL. I'd have to use the um, ice PLL. I'd also need to hook up a HDMI monitor. Um, I don't think this one's got. Has it got HDMI on it? No, this one doesn't. This is just a PGA. So I'd have to dig one out. Now, maybe we can do this on Wednesday and I can get properly prepared. What I need to do is make sure I've got access to a monitor to plug in. That one's just a VGA, so that's not going to help us. Um, let's leave it for next week. I also need to get the tile made and then we can just focus on the HCL. Um, I, I also need to double check, see if the instant stuff on here is going to be the same or different. Because um, these may vary slightly. I also need to check the wiring <clears throat> on the tiles. So let's do that Wednesday. I will look into doing it. I know you want it. I post. Yeah, it's Verilog. Laurie's pointing to some Verilog. Same issue though. I still need the tile and I need a HDMI monitor handy. Um, let's do it on Wednesday. Let's do, let's do something else today. Apologies, I post. I know you want to see the HDMI stuff working. I will get round to it, I promise. I'll have a look at that one as well, um, Nori. Next week. SBIO. So this is setting up. So this again is using the differential outputs, but code wise. Yeah, these are different codes for the setup. So this is going to be slightly different, but we may be able to um, get the codes from this one and use those with the Amaranth stuff. Um. I think that's the critical one, isn't it?
trying to think how it codes that. One minute, where does it where does it use the HDMI PO? The pin type. Da -da, da -da, knock. These are the differential outputs. Um, package pin. HDMI underscore P zero. Package pin. Okay. Um, oh, I see. That is the instance name. So that's slightly different from what we see on the um, on here. I think I don't know if those two um, work the same way. I've not done this stuff in the um, in, in Amaranth before. <clears throat> Other than copying and pasting the um, any existing HDL that uses <clears throat> the uh, special pin configurations. Yeah, I'll have a look at this stuff and then we'll have a go at this on Wednesday. I mean, if push comes to shove, as you say, we know this should work. So if we can get the Verilog stuff working, then we should be able to get the Amaranth stuff working. We may have to change it, um, modify it, but that's interesting all the same. I think this section will be different. I think this coding will be different here. I'm not sure about this. Do set the clock. I don't know what this is. I don't have an RST set on there, I don't think. But maybe that's just an option we're not using on here. I would need to look at the um, configuration. It's been a while since I've looked at that. Okay, well, we do that next week. And I'll, I'll make sure I get the tiles made, and that we can we'll have a HDMI display. Um, I need to think what I've done actually. Where where do I have a HDMI display I can use? I mean, obviously I'm looking at one now, but I can't be using that at the same time. Um, I've got another one somewhere. I'm trying to think where the other one is. I will have to dig it out. Maybe in the attic actually in storage up there it's not kicking around down here this is definitely the GA only this one I've got one that's a DVI not that one though the Fred. Thank you, Laurie. That's useful. My Storm Fred. For the original conversation around that code. Nice. Uh, right, so what else? We were going to talk about, I, I could cover what we're doing on the flash, let's do that. Also, um, 
Yes, there is the question of repositories. Because right now, um, what we have Um, Black Crab has its own repository, but My Storm Ice Logic Deck, which is now incorrectly named as well, um, is probably going to be um, defocused. I need to split it up. So, what we've got here, we've got the um, what's in the docs? So, in the docs, we've got the um, documentation we were working on. Uh, the um, the Rust book. We have the hardware folder, which is currently out of date, which I need to update. Then we have the separate HDL. So really, I think this HDL needs to come out. It needs its own repository because it doesn't necessarily need to be specific to. Uh, the ice logic deck or ice logic bus even good if it's more generic than that <clears throat> um, just trying to remember what the uh, state of the docks was Uh, how do I go to the how do I view the docks God, I can't remember now probably haven't been built a while hold on um, oh it's a different branch no. No. Um. I forgot how to get to the um Documentation. Uh, oh, I I do have a separate repository for tiles. Uh, Laurie asked me. Um, and yes, I will need a separate one for blades, micro blades. Definitely. Although that's slightly less urgent. Um, Oh, it's, look, the link's here. I'm just being an idiot. So... And we have board support. Um, so we've got all the lab notes here. And I need to update this stuff as well over the next week or so. Um, 
but some of this should be generic yeah I don't think this has been updated so the examples we were working on these will need updating But in some ways, it shouldn't be um, logic deck specific. However, in all of them, we would have this. Or the new, new, new equivalent of that. Um, so that's going to be slightly different. You know, if you ran it on a different board, or if you ran this on Black Ice NXT versus Ice Logic Bus itself. Um, so the board file will be, there'll be a common board file which will be called Ice Logic Bus. Then there will be a board file called Black Ice NXT, which will derive its basics from the Ice Logic Bus board file, just in the same way that the Black Ice um, MX derived its functionality from Ice Core and added to that, you know, the carrier specific functions. Um, there's going to be something similar here. So, for example, the Ice Logic bus would not have microblades on it here it have tiles but not microblades whereas the black ice uh, next would derive from the ice logic bus and have everything that has i.e. tiles etc and qspi but it would also in addition have microblades um, but if you look at these examples here, these are board specific. So what you'd be importing here would depend very much on uh, on what you were running it on. Either the platform here might be Nice logic bus, or could it? Could you? Could you use? If it was a tile specific example, then could you use ice logic bus? I not use anything specific for black ice NXT. In which case, this would then be valid, right? Well, not this one, it would have to be Ice Logic Bus because obviously we changed it, right? Um, I mean, let's just revisit what's in these files. So let me switch back for a sec to. So if we look at the ice logic bus file, what we're going to have in here is we will define the tiles. We will define well, actually we're not going to be defining SPI because SPI doesn't mean anything on the ice logic bus because there's nothing connected to those pins. Those pins go to the mezzanine. And it depends what's on the mezzanine as to what will be connected to that. So that doesn't really even belong, belong inside the Ice Logic Bus platform. But the tiles certainly do. The other thing that we'll do is the uh, Hyper RAM, of course, which we haven't added in here. Um, but in fact, no, 
Even the hyper RAM is specific to the Black Eyes NXT because that could be SPI or some other memory because it's not on the Ice Logic bus. So I think simply the Ice Logic bus definition doesn't have SPI, but it does have tiles. Um, won't need the SPI. Oops. Even that isn't really needed. Don't even have a UART. Don't have that. The MES, well, it's not worth defining the MES because it's not connected to anything individually. These only come into play in a board specific way. I mean, we could enumerate them as, as they are named on the mezzanine connector of the ICE logic bus. If anyone ever wanted to just connect to them manually, I suppose. Um, So given that, Um, let's just go back to the browser. So given the way that that would be configured, then we can probably do what we need to do. Just using nice logic bus here, and that will be common for all of the tile examples. That would still work. What wouldn't work is if we had a um, say a wishbone bus inside and we're talking to it, programming these peripherals from the um, you know, over QSPI, because the QSPI itself is specific to the black ice board, or variants thereof. So all of the tile examples here would have to be standalone, which they currently are. We're not doing anything particularly clever here. Just we're just counting and stuff, any LEDs, etc. So, if that was the case, the HDL could be considered logic deck specific, sorry, logic bus specific. Um, oh, oh, this is a bit confusing. So those examples could be, I mean, we could keep this as it is and don't take it much further. 
So each of the tiles will need to be a standalone example. Not one connected to a bus. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to need some sugar in a minute to wake me up. So that would work. So where would that live? Does that stand in its own HDL example? Or does that actually live with the ICE Logic Bus board? Hmm. That means the HDL is specific to that board. What I'm wondering is, is it better to have these, these kind of lab notes with the boards? Or is it better to have a kind of HDL repository itself that covers different boards? What do you think, folks? I post. I would say HDL for each board. I mean, the only disadvantage in that is there may be quite a bit of repetition. Uh, there is also the issue of where you put the Verilog files, like the PCF files. Oh, excuse me. Keeping myself up. Did say I started early today. Um, yeah, where do you put the Verilog files? I think you know, if we were to look at these lab notes, there's no reference to um, Verilog. You know, do do we should we provide Verilog equivalents of everything that we do? So if we do a Blinky in Amaranth, should we do a, a Verilog version of that? Um, it would seem sensible. says so I mean I post says true for repetition but it would focus the intent rather than increasing complexity with a perfectly tight framework yeah um, Laurie says I think you need a minimum set of Verilog stuff well we certainly need some Verilog whatever happens you know if 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 we provided this as a minimum You know, so there was there was an example for each tile, a standalone example for each tile. Then possibly we should we could look at having 
there are a lot of examples for each tile type as well. However, that could get complicated quickly. Um, Okay, so let's just um, let's just say that we did that. So in this section here, where we have tiles, you know, would we then have two point three point one blinky Verilog, two point three point two blinky amaranth, etc., etc.? Or well, have them on the same page? Having them on the same page would be nice, wouldn't it? You could then see them side by side. That could be helpful for people. As long as they're kept simple, that wouldn't require vast quantities of maintenance. It would require some. In which case the HDL would be specific to the logic bus. So that causes a bit of a problem in that if somebody buys a black ice next, the naming may um, may be a bit um, confusing for them. Laurie saying, I've started doing VHDL versions of my examples. I've never really played around with VHDL much. It's something I need to learn at some point. Just more time. Um, but yeah, you know, if you. <laughs> well, whatever I write for these examples in Verilog, you can port them all to VHDL for me, Laurie. How about that? <laughs> then we cover all the bases, wouldn't we? Um, and I think I'd be nice on one page if you could do that, if you could show the three different versions. But then when we come to do some support for Black Ice NXT, the HDL would need to be more comprehensive. Well, in fact, not necessarily more comprehensive, but less basic, because it could for example start doing the bus thing and well it would also need to cover microblades so would that live in a black ice NXT um, in the black ice NXT repository maybe So what I have noticed is um, lots of people doing FPGA contracts in this country tend to ask for VHDL rather than Verilog, I've noticed, which is interesting. So if that's the case then, so I'd need to um, refactor this documentation to obviously be logic bus based. So that'd be the first thing. Um, the 
VHD. Uh, I personally say, and I learned that VHDL is very European flavoured. Yeah, it certainly seems like, well, certainly in the UK. I've no, not worked on FPGAs in Europe, so I don't, I don't know what's used there. Um, the other thing is, so if we just switch back briefly, sorry. Um, See the damn thing now. Where's it gone? I've lost my window. So if we look at the ICE logic deck code, so not the documentation for the moment, the actual code, I've what I've tried to do now is I've tried to put this in a separate Python package. So if you look at the path here, so when we import it, we're importing it like that. So from a package called MyStorm boards, um, and then the board name, in this case, MyStorm bus. What I, what I wanted to do is have all of the um, board files in one Python package um, and maybe even include the PCF files as well. Um, so it's all in one thing and that would have its own, <sighs> again, that, that's going to muck things up. That definitely, if that was the case, that definitely wouldn't um, go in the directory of the board because that would be one that would just be one one package for all of the different boards and then every time I did a new board I would add it to that package that was my thinking rather than you having to install you know separate packages for different boards what do you think on that particular point i'm going to get you some sugar and uh, wait for humble replies I was thinking it might be possible to do it as a as a pip package as well or wheel or whatever they call them the trouble is with python is there's so many package bits package management bitch it's not straightforward but yeah having it in one package would be nice I think and if you could pip install it be even better because pip is nice and simple and lots of people use it do you know what I mean when I say pip
Yeah, I mean, Lori's agreeing should be installable by Pip. I, I was looking through, uh, there was a tutorial I found somewhere on how to, to do it. Um, probably on one of my many tabs. But that was my thinking on that front. So this is slightly different from what we're looking at with the lab notes, the documentation. So basically, a separate repository for that then, I guess, for the board support. But I'm, I'm going to do some other stuff with it as well. Um, because I want to try and automate things like the bus management addresses and any SVD type uh, support. I want to put that in the same package. We haven't really touched on that yet. I, I know I've talked about it in the past, but we haven't even touched on that yet. But again, I'd like that to be in the same package so that when you install the MyStorm boards pip, you get all the MyStorm boards or at least the newer ones, um, which would include Black Ice MX and Ice Core. Um, but you also get um, some of the supporting Python stuff, which I want to do with, that will talk to the STM32 to allow talking to things on the bus and testing and that kind of stuff because I want to write that in Python as well um, so Lloyd says at the moment you don't have hardware repositories nothing for black ice NXT and ILB is out of date and called ILD. That's correct. Which is, and I haven't done anything because I still try to work out what to do and how to do it, how to um, configure things, arrange things. So I think. I think we've kind of got a plan coming together. So the basic tile-like stuff with the simple examples that's built on the stuff we've already got will be in the respective uh, repositories for that board. And in our case, we've got a we've got to do a what do you call it? We've got a create a new repository really called uh, Ice Logic Bus. We don't have that yet. And we need to port what we've got in uh, Ice Logic Deck to Ice Logic Bus. We also have to create the MyStorm Boards repository. And we also need to create a Black Ice NXT repository. Um, I guess on the Black Ice NXT we'd have, you know, a lab notes in the same fashion, but rather than starting from basics, um, with the tiles, because that's already covered by the Ice uh, Logic Bus, um, we could possibly start them at the kind of bus level, focus on the bus level. However, what I'm missing there is the thing that we do add with the um, black ice next is the microblades. 
those will also have to be documented. In addition, there will have to be a microblades directory that defined the specification of microblades. So the question is, where does the HDL go for that? It wouldn't probably wouldn't want to go in the microblade repository. Illogical as that sounds, um, it's, that stuff is going to be to a degree specific. to the board. Uh, Laurie is saying you do already have mice on boards, but it's out there. Yeah, I think I created that already. Um. And I just haven't updated it. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. That hasn't been updated for 17 days. So it's a little bit out of date. But yeah, so that's already set up. just a couple of weeks behind um, so clearly I've got some documentation and repository stuff that I need to update um, I guess initially the microblade stuff should go under the black ice NXT as in the HDL examples because they are currently specific to black ice that won't be the case in the future but for now that is the case um, Um, and I haven't really thought that much about the um, blades, although it will be similar to the approach that I've got here with the um, with the tiles. So I define a pinout, you know, like microblade one, the pins that it's connected to, and then have. Um, uh, resources just like the tiles um, And then in use, we could do something similar to what we're doing here, where we're abstracting um, hold on, that's not a good idea. Seven segments, here we go. So what we're doing here is we're um, we've got a library for the device and then 
when we build it we pass in tile resource So we'll have like a microblade resource, just like we're using the um, tile resource. We do a similar sort of thing, similar sort of abstraction, at least for MOMF. For the PCF files, it's a bit more complicated. For PCF, uh, you can't inherit from ice logic bus you have to rewrite the entire piece you have to add the uh, ice logic bus bits in it but um, yeah because if we look at the seven segment tile resource we do something similar but these will be for blades where you pass in the blade number Instead of the tile number and this will be called a blade resource or whatever or blade resources but the same sort of pattern yeah okay cool well that kind of gives me uh, a plan and enough to work on. And if anyone has any ideas or differences to those current plans, let me know. Um, what else should we cover today? Uh, da, 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 da. I wonder. Um, well, let's just cover quickly what I did earlier. Um, oh, that's annoying. Let's have a quick. So, one, one of the things I was doing earlier is, um, something I've forgotten about was flash so we're just switching back to sorry head change take the HDL head off put the rust head back on so we have an FPGA structure which I covered last time the other structure we're going to need is the flash structure so I've started work on that so the flash structure really just houses the um, the SPI, so let me explain what, what the configuration is here. If we look at the um, circuit first, So the um, schematic for black ice, what you see here, this is on the STM32. We have an SPI that isn't connected to the FPGA in any way. And this SPI connects to the flash. So there's a flash chip that's dedicated to the SPI because what we, we need, because we're not uh, attaching um, a flash, a boot flash to the um, ICE 40, we need some way of storing the image we want it to boot into. So when we're not dynamically programming it using the uh, USB, um, you know, when you're deploying it, for example, or when you want it to power up, you need it to run a specific. Um, FPGA synthesis, right? So you need somewhere to store that. Now I don't want to use the internal flash on the STM32 uh, F7 because there isn't much of it. 
it's useful because it's very fast, but it's mainly used for the firmware. Um, yeah, I might be able to use it for some fonts or something, depending on how, how big stuff is. But generally, I'm not using it for the FPGA image. I'm I've got an external flash, SPI flash, which I think is a 32 megabit, or is it a 16 megabit? Let's assume it's a 16 megabit for now, because I can't remember. Um, anyhow, that's connected directly to the STM32. So uh, we need to be able to cover that. So, because what we're going to need to be able to do is be able to talk to that so that we can store FPGA or ICE 40 images in there. Um, so, going back to the code. Uh, I figured I should create, you know, uh, a structure to hold that. So that structure um, is based on a bunch of pins, these pins. Um, so one of them is just a bit banged select. So FSS that just stands for flash serial select, uh, flash clock or what would be SCK in a normal um, SPI? Um, flash SO, which is actually mastering serial out that connects to the serial out on the flash. And then FSI, which is master out serial in, in old terminology, or SI at serial in. From the point of view of the um, flash itself. So those are the four pins that I just showed you on the circuit and from those what we do is we create uh, first the SPI device using the HAL here. Um, so we're creating a new SPI instance. It's actually the SPI2 peripheral on the STM32, um, we're using these pins. We're only using three of the pins because the other pin we're going to select, we're going to bit bang. And uh, Lloyd's saying, Are you going to stick with just SPI rather than QSPI for the flash? The answer is yes, because I don't have any choice. There is only one QSPI peripheral that I can use on the STM32. Um, because of the way it's configured. Not only that, because I'm using up all the pins to do all the other stuff and trying to have two QSPIs is actually, um, it's just not possible for the black ice configuration. I did look at that originally. I would love to have had a separate QSPI, um, but I don't have, so we have to use SPI. Now, the only time this is used, remember, Laurie, is um, for the images, really, the FPGA images. So we would be using this, say, when we power up. So what would happen is the firmware will go to the uh, SPI and it will take it a chunk at a time from the SPI flash and start programming the SPI uh, of the ICE-40 in slave mode. So when the ICE-40 is in slave mode, uh, the, 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 it only has uh, SPI four lines. You can't program it in QSPI. ICE-40 doesn't support that. Um, not only that, but the SPI bandwidth is limited, so you can't actually program it that fast. As I've mentioned before, you have to uh, down your speed. Given all of that, SPI flash is more than fast enough because you can't output it any faster. And what's nice about it, because it's separate for the, uh, you know, it's using a separate SPI bus on the STM32 to the QSPI, which is programming in one bit mode, the ICE40, is you can read from one with a small amount of memory, buffer it, and send it straight out. Whereas before, when it was on a shared bus, you had the issue of being able to read from the same bus and then write to the same bus. Not only that, but you had to bit bang one of them, which slowed it down a lot. 
So this way, it's about as efficient as it can be. So for any given FPGA synthesis image that you have on the flash chip, you can just read it using SPI and program the IS-40 as fast as you can. You know, the limiting factor here is not going to be, uh, I don't think, the read speed or the SPI. So not having QSPI isn't going to be um, a disability. But normally, yes, I would prefer to connect flash over QSPI rather than SPI because it's generally faster. But in our case, it doesn't matter because we're limited by the speed that we can actually write or program, sorry, the ICE-40. I hope that explains it. So anyhow, that's what this SPI is for. So we create the SPI. Then we enable it, so we pass in the mode that we're going to operate. Now remember that SPI has different modes, it has phase and polarity that you have to set. So this this changes where which clock edge is used to log the data in and out, um, etc. So to set, pass that in, uh, you also have to pass the frequency we're going to operate at. In this case I've just set it to a nominal one one megahertz we can probably go up to about 15 maybe i haven't tried it yet um we have to bath in the clocks and the uh, apb one bus which is what it's connected to and that sets it all up and gets it running i can then create my new flash structure where i pass in the select signal which is a bit bang signal um which is called fss here and the SPI that I've just created. I can then share this using the uh, shared resources in RTIC as before. So the USB uh, task, interrupt task, and then pick that up and be able to write to it. Um, and just to show that it's working, the other thing that I worked on this afternoon is just getting it to do something basic. So here what I'm doing is I'm getting the flash ID and I'm printing it out. So actually if you look here, can, is, is that big enough for you to be able to see actually? Hold on, let's um, just make that a bit bigger. You can see it ran here. So it's read out the ID of the flash chip over SPI. Which is this here. Don't need that anymore. Not just for testing. Um, and just to show you that. Got myself mixed up with this earlier. Luckily, Laurie came along and helped me. Um, basically, the transfer is uh, very simple. Pulls the SS low, uses the SPI to do a transfer in this case, and then pulls that high. Now, a transfer is different from a send on the SPI. A send just sends bytes and doesn't receive anything back. It ignores what comes back from the uh, slave out. Whereas in a transfer, it actually takes what comes back through the slave out, i.e. the return, um, which is byte shifted uh, from the peripheral that you're talking to, flash in this case. And it um, actually stores it in the uh, array that you're passing in, or the slice of the array that you're passing it in that gets modified. Um, but if you want to see how the ID works, quite simple. We start off with um, basically an empty um, array of four unsigned 8-bit um, locations. We then set that to the wake up command. I need to enumerate all these and add these in, but I just haven't had a chance yet. So we send the wake up command. So we do a transaction including the um, 
the, the bit banging of the select pins and then we send out the ID query and then the IDC array then contains um, four bytes, these four bytes and you'll find that the first one was FF which is basically because there wasn't anything in the output buffer from the, buffer from the slave output it would all just be high, pulled high um, and then you'll have the other three uh, digits from the ID call, the last ID call which is this one um, and then all I'm doing is I'm converting that into a U32 by shifting the 8 bits into a single U32 uh, so it can appear as a U32 down here on output. Um, Western Long says you guys program the STM32 using Rust? Question mark. Uh, yes that is correct. The previous version of uh, MyStorm uh, the MyStorm firmware for the Ice Core and the Black Ice MX was written in C slash C++ but yeah the new firmware is being written in Rust so basically I've started off putting the flash implementation in here and I need to add a send um, etc etc fact the send it's probably going to be very simple because it just ends up looking a bit like this I don't think the data needs to be mutable that would probably work uh, and that is probably not going to be the right size I need to sort this uh, sizing out as well because that's a limitation that I need to make this work for a number of different sizes um, Laurie's saying, um, on startup, are you planning to look for a bitstream at the start of a flash? And if so, program the FPGA with it? The answer to that is yes. That was kind of the assumption I was working on, uh, unless someone's got some other ideas. I think it seems like the sensible thing to do. Uh, Western Long says, cool, got to give it a try too. Yeah, Rust is, Rust is nice. It's got a bit of a learning curve. Um, particularly on the embedded side. Because it's concerned about a lot of things that you don't bother concerning yourself in C. So when you hit it, you think, God, my God, it's being pedantic about its types and stuff. But what it tries to do is make everything checked at compile time that it possibly can from a safety point of view etc and a type point of view but it can be uh, niggly and frustrating when you start with it because of that um, but that's purely because if you haven't been writing in something like Rust before you've been cutting corners quite frankly um, and taking all sorts of chances that you probably weren't even thinking about but Rust does make you think about and it's got some cool language features as well on top, which is nice. So it's not, you know, um, just about safety and uh, critical use. It's actually got some real benefits. And in terms of performance, it's very similar to C, C++. So, yeah. Um, So I've got to do the rest of these. So in fact, right. Um, 
that's not going to work because we've got to do all of the, um, the arrays mem first stuff. Um, and we might need an address here to write to. So we're going to have a look at that. But anyhow, I started getting the um, some some flash stuff done. Basically, what else? What else? What else? Uh, we need to add a read, obviously. Um, So, what would that look like? I'm just trying to remember. What does it take? Assuming it uses the array in the same way. Hold on, I did have an example somewhere in the how. Let me have a look. Yeah, I mean, with the flash read, it's going to be more complicated because it's going to be more like a transfer because um, you need to send and receive, I think. I'm just thinking about the dresses as well. So yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, don't have a flash example to work from. I've got QSBI examples, but not spy examples. So what we probably need to send in this case would be, you normally need to send the command, the address, and then you need to read um, as many data points. As necessary. So I mean that wouldn't be four, that would be more than four. But yeah, that's that's for another day. These are all to do's basically. Um, there's probably some code out there that I can crib from, 
that might save me a bit of time particularly if they've coded for this particular flash chip I'll have a look around because they may have things like enumerations for the modes addresses I'll have to look at things like um, page sizes and how much what the smallest chunk is that you need to erase in order to write to and all that kind of stuff been a while since I've looked at that but I need to get that done I mean it's not hugely important at this point to get it done because it's a lower priority because of the way we're using the um, boards initially but it will need to be there um, so that was some of the stuff I started working on today and I've got to continue that and get that sorted uh, what else did I cover? Oh, I should just show you also. Yeah, um, when I've defined this structure, again, a little bit of type hell. If you remember, we did a bit of flash stuff before, but that's, we've already seen the definition of the, or the type specific nature of that pin, the select pin that we're we'll banging. But also SPI is a particular type I've created here. Primarily because it's so complicated, because the spy type has to include inside it um, the enabled structure result mode plus the constant definition of which peripheral it is and the pins. Um, in fact, I wonder. I know this is a one nine here, but it makes it difficult to read. Maybe I can do something like this to make it a bit more readable. Because it's very difficult to read as is. Um, so yes, yeah, so the spy contains these devices and each pin, because it's a unique type on itself, you have to specify. And I noticed they changed this in the recent how, how the order of the arguments and stuff, which makes it a bit more complicated. So obviously it's port B, that's what the, the uh, char is standing for, it's the, the port, the pin number of that port, pin 13. It's in an alternate mode. And now the alternate mode has to be specified, which is the alternate mode, because these are numerical modes. Um, you can get these by looking at, um, uh, do I have one open? Yeah, if you look at the data sheets, so there. You, you normally get these tables for the peripherals. So if we look at PB13 here, BB13, if we look, the spy function that we're looking for here, so spy2 SCK configuration of that pin is alternate function five. So we get our number five there for the alternate function. And then also that it's push pull because you may wanna change what, what, what the mode of operation is that pin so you have to specify that for the three pins which in this case I, I think are um, that's the clock serial clock uh, probably mozzie and then miso what could be the other way around I forget and because that's all such a mouthful I've just created a new type called HSPI I don't want to call it HSPI because that was what it was called before when I did that thing. So it just saves me writing it here and clunking up this whole structure with that. It's just a shorthand for your types. Um, Laurie, these are the flash functions I've used in C soft cores. Sorry, I was talking about something there and I wasn't showing you. So let me just go back. Sorry. Very naughty of me. Turn the browser off for a sec. So what I was saying here is 
Um, when we look at the structure of the flash, there's two things. There's the uh, select pin, and then there's the SPI peripheral. And I've got a name here which is just called HSPI. Maybe that should be SPIT, but anyhow. Um, that is a complicated type because it is SPI that includes all these pin types, which includes alternate type, etc., etc. Plus, it includes the um, the enabled mode. So the types can be complicated in Rust. So by creating this type, I just create a shorthand for it rather than cluttering up this structure. Um, just a bit easier to read. Um, going back, so um, Laurie was saying he's got a Ramsock library. Cool, yeah, I'll have a look at this. Could be useful. Sorry. I know it's in C and I have to convert it over, but it's yeah, it's gonna be similar. Cool. Much appreciated, Lauren. Um I do have some of that covered in the my storm firmware as well. And that's in um a C format. But yours is probably a bit more comprehensive. Mine was very simple. Yeah, I'll have a look through and rewrite that. Probably in, um, excuse me, in um, Rust. Right, so it's that stuff. Um, what else are we left to do? Still got to clean up some of this stuff. I've got a whole bunch of imports I'm not using. I think functionally we've got all of the things covered here. We haven't done the display yet, but that's complicated. I'm leaving that. It's really complicated, that is. Um, we've got the flash. Oh yeah, the other thing that I was going to think of. So currently, if we look, let me show you how the firmware currently is. We're working on a simple backward compatible mode with the current versions of um, Black Ice MX, or Ice Core in fact. And the way that works is, literally, what we're doing is, this. Th th we're defining a task here which is really just an interrupt task. It's based on the OTG interrupt event. Um, so when we get that event, we then take a look at the serial implementation that is wrapped inside of the USB CDC class and we see if there's any characters you know that's what this is doing here and that returns uh, okay if there is it ignores it if it's not okay if it's returned um, it also returns this nice little count so we know how many characters, how many bytes we're receiving. Okay. We then create a lock on all of these things. Uh, header, byte count, and program the just local shared variables. ICE is the FPGA driver. We'll also add in here uh, the flash eventually. So we're locking all of that um, to make sure we've got safe access. Oops, sorry, my bad. Start again. So this is the uh, you, you, this is the basically the task or interrupt driven event um, for the USB. We're checking the USB CDC device and we're seeing if there's anything being read on the um, embedded serial in that. Uh, if it returns OK, we get a count of the number of bytes coming in. What we then do is we lock these uh, shared resources. OK, these are just local variables and ICE is the FPGA um, device. 
So we lock those and we can then operate safely on them. Um, we're counting as we go along how many bytes we've got. So we're going to add the count because this is the number of bytes that we're going to process that have been dumped in. We then got a simple for loop um, that runs through each of those characters. Um, and what we're doing is we're scanning for this, this specific uh, byte signature, which exists in the image files that are created by the tools. Um, these are particular to the ICE 40, sorry, or the ICE range of, um, uh, of FPGA chips and the image files. Okay, so what we're doing is we're magically just looking at any incoming of a USB and if we see that device signature, um, we know it's uh, an image is being sent, an FPGA image is being sent, basically. So it's a little auto magic cheat. So it's very, very simple. And then, then what we do is, you know, if we see that, we then go and reset the ice. Uh, FPGA, uh, we turn the select, we activate the select and then we start sending those bytes that we've got here. Um, incrementing as we go along uh, and then eventually because we know the size of the FPGA image um, when we've processed that many bytes we know that we can finish the process so what we do is we, we go through the exit procedure of programming the ICE um, by clearing its buffers, among other things. Among other, uh, uh, other things. Um, and then we know it's programmed. In this case, what we're doing, we're then waiting a delay and then we're testing the QSPI. Because I'm assuming, because the, the, the version we're looking at here was one where we were testing the QSPI. So we would have just sent it some synthesis, a synthesized image that has QSPI support. Now, that's all well and good for testing and that's exactly how this has been set up and it's also backward compatible with the tools. It enables us to send HDL and images dynamically to the FPGA. But moving forward, uh, this will need to be a proper state machine and it will have modes. So one of the things, I, I was talking to Laurie about this the other day, so what we will need to do is we will need to monitor the uh, USB incoming and have an operation such that we can ask it to do different things. Given that it looks just like a serial port um, over USB, what we could do is we could send, have a f very strict format, very simple format that goes uh, command uh, address no command length and address um, so what that would do for example is we our command could be program or synthesize um, the length which would be equivalent to you know that number of bytes that I just showed you, which was the size of the image file, and then address, which would be, in this case, it would be always be zero, because it's unnecessary when we're programming it. So when we see the those commands, we know we're gonna have that many bytes coming at us that represent the image. So it should switch into that mode uh, and start programming the ICE-40. Or alternatively, if we see program, and size and then an address that is non-zero that could be where we're putting it in flash um, so we could have an ad address map and we could have multiple images potentially to do that then another command might be uh, a write command and what that does is that has a write, has a length, i.e. the number of bytes we're going to write, and then the starting address. 
Now the starting address in this case might be um, the bus address inside the peripheral of the FPI. So having synthesized something that's running on the FPGA, then what we want to do is send something to one of the peripherals on the FPGA, for maybe for testing purposes or something. So this is a bit like the wishbone utility that comes with Litex that enables you to, you know, have a command line or a Python script that's capable of sending information to, uh, to effectively to the peripherals inside the FPGA to actually have them do different things. So it's useful for testing and all sorts of other things. And we can have as many different types of commands as we like. And we can have a read, etc., etc. So we could read back, you know, the program that's in Flash, for example. Or we could read back the um, uh, the values of a peripheral inside the synthesis, etc., etc., etc. So this is the format that I'm thinking we could go with. Um, the only downside of doing this is the moment that we do that and we have this command length address format that heads any data we're sending is we lose the automagic image detection um, and make it not compatible with any of the previous generations of black eyes which have had that automagic thing. Now, the question is, do we want to do that? And if so, how do we handle the fact that that's different? I mean, we could, for example, there is a button on the black ice next board, which can be used to put it in DFU mode when you power up, or can be used dynamically as a mode button. Now we did this on the black ice MX, whereby the normal programming mode so when you sent the program and it automatic, automatically detected the ID and programmed it, by default it would do it dynamically. It wouldn't store anything in Flash. And if you wanted to store it in Flash, what you do is you press the button on the Black Ice MX and then the LEDs would change from green to yellow, indicating that it was now in Flash mode. And that meant that whenever you then programmed it, it stored it in Flash. Um, that made it permanent. So what we could do on the Black Ice next is have that same feature because we've got the um, RGB LED there we could have two different modes on the Black Ice NX and the default mode if you don't do anything so you just leave it as powered on um, in green or whatever colour then it would operate just like Black Ice NX did by, oh, sorry, Black Ice MX did in terms of it just programs it when you send it the file, it automatically looks for that signature and programs it. So it would be backward compatible out of the box. But then you could have this advanced mode. So if you press the button when it's powered, um, that would put it into an advanced mode and the LED would change color to indicate that it's in advanced mode. And then in advanced mode, it works as I mentioned before where you have this command length address scheme so what what do people think about that I'm just trying to have my cake and eat it here really so by default it acts just like uh, all the black ice or all the recent black ice products did before at the box um, but then when you press the button, you have this, you switch it into this more advanced mode. Whereby you can do more than just programming ice 40. You can write to the flash. You can program peripherals over the QSBI bus from a USB, a program running on the host talking over USB to it. Does that work? Or is that too complicated? Is it a satisfactory compromise? Is it too much of a compromise? Am I making it unnecessarily complicated?
Then Laurie says, I would be happy to f forget about the backward compatible mode. Yes, but you already know about that. No, not everyone has that experience and knowledge. What do others think? Windows users mainly used APIO and that had a programming utility anyway. Black Eyes Prog. Yeah, by the way, if we change it and don't have this by default, it breaks all of that APIO stuff. So if people are using iStorm, that wouldn't work. And they don't really update it much. Uh, Western Long says, as long as there are examples, documentation for the new mode, new mode, backwards compatibility doesn't seem that important to me though. Me too, sorry. Laurie says Mac, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, comma, and Linux users had to know about specific di devices and use STTY. This is true, and that's a, another issue that we kind of need to discuss as well. But So the old method was not simple. Programming tool is easier to use. It's a good point. The old method was very platform specific.
um, the tool I would do if I was doing a tool, which I would plan on doing, will be Python based, which should make it more portable. He said, ha 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 ha, portable Python, that would be a good thing. Um, it still has to try and talk to the devices. I could take a leaf out of the APIO book. I think they have, um, I think their APIO is Python based. Um, and you, you can use a libusb wrapper. But again, it's different on Windows compared to Linux, probably compared to Mac as well. But. And you still need some way of choosing which which port it is. I do have some IDs I can use on the USB side that are unique. But then the tools to query the USB have to be able to support that in a multi-platform way that can read the vendor ID and device ID. I do remember looking at some of the APIO stuff. Ambience. Obi Khan. How does it get the um, the device name? Yeah, you'd have to pass this in. Which, oh, sorry, um, I'm being a twat. So uh, this is the ice proc uh, that um, Laurie pointed me to, um, which is based on the Obijan. Obi Wan, Obi Juan uh, code that was used under um, APIO. Um, but of course, usage here assumes you know that, right? So it's not cross platform. They do have something that is more cross-platform, I seem to remember. Uh, there isn't... Uh, APIO config file. I'm trying to think. Let me um, see if we can find... Oh, 
fact, no, forget this, forget this. Uh, APIO GitHub. I hate um, GitHub search. APIO. Supported boards. Uh, so link to the um, PIO drivers, serial enable. Um, set up commands. APIO drivers. Enable dis disable. Serial enable. So what it's saying here is APIO driver serial enable, configure serial drivers for FPGA. Uh, serial drivers enabled, unplug and reconnect your board. Is that how it does it? It's a long time since I've used it, so I can't remember now. But w won't that change? Hmm. For some reason I thought they had something a bit more. So they must they must notice the reconnect. But what happens if you then change later unplug and replug it and it gets a different port number? Does it deal with that? Presumably not. Then find the device and the vendor and the product. Oh, I see. Oh, I don't think we've changed that, have we? So that's been constant. So these are the default IDs that you get with the STE HAL. Um, the problem with that is they get used elsewhere. So for example, if you plug in an ST link, I th think you get the same pair. If it's got a serial port which the ST Link 3 does have. Um, I've also seen it elsewhere. However, I do have um, IDs that I can use here instead to avoid that. So uh, yeah, so I'd need to see how they went about that. There's got to be a script somewhere.
So I could have a I could cheat. So I'm just scrubbing through here to see if um, I know there's some code because I remember seeing it years ago. But I mean, it might have changed now, but I mean, just see what your libraries are using. Get serial ports. So they're getting a list of serial ports to do. <laughs> Get a serial port. Where are they doing this for port description of ID in COM ports? Serial tools, list ports. Ah, <sighs> serial tools, ports. Serial tools, list ports. Where are the serial tools? Are they uh, an external dependency? I don't know. Yeah, I need to dig around a bit more and find out what they're doing. But there needs to be, you know, basically a Python script that works in a platform independent way that can recognize the ID of the black eyes, the VID and PID. Is it VID and PID or VID and HID, whatever it's called. And then we can look for specific devices. Resources in the domain. Scrums, cranky. Um, LS serial. 
Oh, so serial ports equal util get serial ports, which we saw before. A serial port and serial ports. Port, get description, get the whole file ID. TDI devices, etc., etc., etc. Uh, where would I see dependencies? Will this mention dependencies? No. Um, Requires click semantic version request colorama pie serial. There we go. That's what they're using. Pie serial. So I need to have a look at that. Presumably, that's platform independent. Uh, Pi serial. This module encapsulates the access for serial port. It provides backends for Python running on Windows, OS 10, Linux, BSD, blah, 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 blah named serial automatically detects the appropriate backend so yeah this is probably what I need to um, work with PySeal can be used from PyPy. From Conda, yeah. Short introduction. Opening serial ports, import serial, set serial. There you are literally doing it, you're not scanning it, right? Configuring ports later, get a serial instance and configure it later. Read line, end of line. Listing ports, here we go. Python M, serial tools, list ports. We'll print a list of available ports. It is also possible to add a regex. Regular expression as the first argument, and the list will only include entries that match. Note the enumeration may not work on all operating systems. It may be incomplete. List unavailable ports or may lack detailed descriptions of ports. Here, right. PCO includes a small console. Yeah, I wonder how well that works. And what does it give you? What does that actually return? Does that give you the USB ID as well? I see I'm just one for some. Serial tool list ports. <laughs> Oh, 
Mark's turn. Yeah, so it looks like a good library to use to do this. I think I've heard of this before. I don't know if I've ever used it. Possibly. 485. Okay. Tools, maybe. Serial ports, list tool. This module can be executed to get a list of ports. Contains the following functions. Da -da 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 returns a list containing list port info objects. This object holds information about serial port. It supports index access for backward compatibility device. Full device name slash path eg da -da -da -da. I wonder what it shows up in as Windows then. Short name Description hardware ID technical description or not applicable. This is also the information returned as a third element when accessed by index. USB specific data. These are all none if it's not a USB device. Yeah, so you've got VID, PID, etc. Good. Nice. Yeah, this is the way to go. Plus, is a good example, as in API. API already uses it, so that's the way to do it. And then use the unique IDs that I've got. Cool. Right, how are we doing for time? Wow. I think I'm going to call it for the day. Thank you for the all participation participation guys um, let's look I need to look at doing the reorg of the repositories etc a bit of refactoring I also need to probably get the um, tile made for the HTMI and have a look at the code so that we can perhaps do that on Wednesday if folks would like but anyhow, thank you for joining me. I'm now going to go and rest. Although I may be on Discord for a little bit longer. Um, so, ciao and have a nice weekend, everyone.